Welcome everyone to this uh, meeting, this webinar of the Irish Science and Technology Journalists Association. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this this evening. We have, we're lucky enough to have Dr. Elizabeth Bix here. She's a scientific, or sorry, a science integrity consultant. Now we all know that science is, has a light side, there's a lot of positives to it, but there is a dark side as well. We're gonna hear about the dark side of science now uh, in this talk, which is titled Misconduct in Biomedical Literature and Dr. Bix is a specialist in this. So you're, you're very welcome and uh, thank you for talking to us this evening, Dr. Bix. Thank you so much for, uh, for hosting me. It's my pleasure. I'm, yeah, I'm in LA, um, normally live in uh, near San Francisco, but today uh, presenting from my uh, vacation rental. Um, yeah, good evening, everyone. Can I get a thumbs up? <laughs> If you can see was like awesome, great. So um, I am a by uh, origin, I'm a microbiologist and uh, sort of moved towards a uh, to to work in scientific integrity. Uh, but my background is in microbiology. I have a PhD there. I'm from the Netherlands. And before I start my talk, since one of the things I might criticize about the scientific paper is a lack of disclosures. So I want to start becoming very clear what my disclosures are. I am not employed. I'm not, um, I'm sort of self-employed. I'm a consultant. I do not work for a university or a publisher or anything. I'm self-employed, but how do I make my money? Uh, that is by re doing consulting work for publishers or academic institutions. I also receive uh, speaker fees to talk about science integrity at institutions and publishers. People also donate money for my work because uh, most of the work I do is, is volunteer based. So people support it through small monthly donations at patreon.com, which uh, I'm not asking for money, but this is uh, one of my sources of income. And I have worked for a fraudulent company, so I'll get that out of the way. Um, Ubiome, that was the company I worked for. The, uh, and I have four patents from that uh, period. I uh, worked there before the FBI did a raid of the offices in San Francisco, and they charged the, the two founders, the CEO and the CTO, with insurance fraud. So it wasn't scientific fraud, it was insurance fraud. Uh, a very complex case, uh, apparently they have, the founders have fled to Germany and are now fugitives. <laughs> so it's, I hope there will be a movie of uh, one day of this, uh, this case, and I have worked there but none of the employees have ever been charged uh, with the fraud. It was the founders who have been found responsible for that. But I have a lot of haters and they will always say, oh, but you worked for a fraudulent company. So that mean, that must mean that you're fraudulent too. No, I, uh, I hope I wasn't. I was never interviewed by the FBI. But uh, an interesting, um, I guess, uh, scar on my resume. So... Um, I want to start with a very recent article. I think this came out two days ago in The Economist. There's a worrying amount of fraud in medical research and a worrying unwillingness to do anything about it. So I'll, I'll talk about both of these aspects today. And you might be surprised to hear about fraud in science. And, and I was actually also, I uh, had until maybe 10 years ago, assumed that all scientists were super honest people that none of us would ever do fraud and that we all had this, um, this shiny idea of working to make the world a better place. Biomedical research or, or any other research, I felt that we as scientists were, were doing our best and we're all honest. Well, I learned that, that this is not the case. There is, it appears to be a growing amount of fraud. I'm not sure if it's growing, but there's definitely growing awareness of scientific fraud. And, and you might have also, if you've read this article, here are two very interesting graphs about this. So often for, um, if a scientific paper has either an error or fraud, it can be corrected or retracted. So a scientific retraction means that a paper is still there. You can still read it, it's still there, but it has this watermark retracted over it. And um, you can still cite it, but it's a clear warning that, that the, the conclusions of that paper are no longer true. So the amount of retractions in this, uh, according to this graph has have grown spectacularly in the past um, 10 years or so. But I do think it's a little bit of a misleading graph because any topic you type in will have a graph like that. It just seems that the amount of scientific papers has exploded as well. So I'm not quite sure 
what the ratio is between the retracted and the published papers. Uh, but the published papers as the denominator also have gone up. But it's, it's, you, you will very likely read much more about retracted scientific papers than 10 years ago. The reasons for these retractions are often suspected fraud or plagiarism, and both would fall under science misconduct, um, and much less so errors or yeah, confirmed fraud. I did, it's it's a bit of a um, a dark, uh, a, 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 an unclear distinction to me because you can suspect fraud, but how to confirm it? I don't know. I, that that seems like a more legal term, but definitely fraud suspected or confirmed is a big. Uh, reason for, for these retractions. And so why should we care about that? Um, well, I as a scientist, but also I would assume anybody in the world would like to think of science that it is about finding the truth. At least that is for me the core of science. And of course, we can have long discussions if you agree with that or not. But for me, science should be about finding the truth. And science also builds upon science. As a scientist, we never publish by ourselves. We publish based on the work of others. So I see science publications as building blocks in the great wall of science. And, and if, so every, every stone, every publication rests on a lot of other publications. And if we have a paper with an error or with suspected fraud, let's say a paper has been made up, made up then that means that all the other citing that paper and building on that work are also not in stable grounds. So because we build on each other's work, we should care about a paper that has an error in it. And even after, uh, after peer review and publication, a paper could turn out to contain an error. There is, of course, the process of peer review where other scientists will look at it. But I think most scientists, at least until recently, have not really thought about science papers as potentially containing fraud. I think most peer reviewers will look at a paper with the assumption that this is really what happened, that these patients really existed, and that this was really the result of, the, of their analysis. And I think, I hope by talking about it, to make people aware that there is fraud, to not be completely naive. Uh, and of course, we should trust science, but there is fraud in science. Science is not immune to fraud. So I hope to make some awareness about that. But it will it turn out, as I, I will talk about it, it's very hard to know if a scientific paper contains an error or contains fraudulent data. Now, let's take a step back and, and, and talk about what is science misconduct. So this slide is sort of showing what science misconduct is and is not. And there are def different definitions uh, in different countries. And as I work in the, in the US and US, US is, of course, one of the big uh, the countries that has uh, a very large output of scientific papers. I'm, I'm showing this slide. I'm not sure how the definition is in other countries. It might be slightly different. Um, and so uh, there are things like questionable research practices, QRP. Those would be, let's say, not publishing all your results, not citing relevant papers, or even leaving out an author who should have been an author, or adding an author who should not have been an author. Uh, picking the wrong statistical methods, um, or even perhaps p-hacking or incomplete reporting, all these things would fall under questionable research practices. So they're, you know, they're bad, but they're not really fraud. So in the US, science misconduct is defined as one of three things, plagiarism, falsification, or fabrication, where plagiarism, I think that's a very familiar concept, uh, that is copying somebody else's text or ideas without great giving the proper credit, not putting it between quotation marks, uh, not um, uh, citing the relevant paper. And this is how I actually started in this uh, the business of doing science misconduct research. I just happened to find a paper that had quoted my text. And, and this graph under here is uh, the, the text marked in red is the text from that paper that had borrowed my, my uh, written text. So the red text is mine. The other, other colors reflect, reflect text from different papers that uh, they also had stolen. So th this particular paper turned out to have a patchwork of different copy and pasted uh, text paragraphs, sort of a Frankenstein monster of, of, uh, of uh, other people's text. 
And so that is plagiarism, this paper got retracted. Um, but that sort of led me into this whole business of science misconduct and learning about it and being horrified about it and being angry about it. The other two uh, uh, types of science misconduct are falsification and fabrication. Um, and uh, where falsification is where a person does an experiment but changes the outcome a little bit intentionally with the intention to mislead and to make the results look better. For example, you do an experiment and it doesn't quite fit your hypothesis. Um, you know, you could change the outcome a little bit to, to better fit your hypothesis or an outlier that doesn't quite match your beautiful graph. Or you could uh, you do a measurement and a sample is just a negative, but you you add a digit or you add, you know, you change one of the digits and now suddenly it crosses a threshold and it becomes a positive and your results look better because of that. So that would be falsification. Fabrication is even worse. That's a person completely making up results and presenting them as real, making up patients, making up patient data, uh, no doing no measurements at all. So these are the three types of, uh, of science misconduct. And you probably have heard about some, some cases in the news. These are some older cases that have um, gained a lot of attention. So Andrew Wakefield in uh, a 99, 1998 Lancet paper claimed that autism was correlated with vaccination of the MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccines. And uh, that paper turned out to contain falsified data. So there were some real patients, but some of the data in that, pa in that paper had been changed to make the results look a little bit better. Like dates had been changed, pathology reports had been changed. It took 12 years to retract the paper. And still a lot of people believe that science, uh, that um, vaccines are correlated to autism. And, and I think I don't have to really tell anybody that vaccine skepticism is, is, uh, has risen tremendously in the past two or two and a half years with COVID. Um, there are many other cases, uh, Jan Hendrik Schoen in the US, um, Haruko Obakada in Japan, and Diederik Stapel in the Netherlands. Uh, the latter example is relevant for me. I am from the Netherlands, so this, this was a case that rocked, in a bad way, the scientific community in the Netherlands. Um, turned out that, that this psychologist had made up uh, over 50 studies, and he has 58 retractions. So those are some cases that are a little bit older, but there are also newer cases that you might have seen in the news. So there was this, this Alzheimer paper, which was published already in 2006 in Nature. And uh, it was a, an important paper in the Alzheimer's field. And uh, by the summer of last year, it turned out that this paper contained some falsified images. And I was consulted by science, by, the, by Charles Spiller, the science journalist who initially wrote about this as a consultant, uh, unpaid, I have to add, <laughs> but I consulted about this case and I, I confirmed that this uh, paper from 2006 appeared to have falsified um, images. So there was some Photoshopping in these images and that is what I specialize in. And this is, this is still uh, sending shock waves in the Alzheimer's community, uh, even though it's not like, an, I mean, it's an important paper, but it's not like the paper that uh, confirmed the beta amyloid hypothesis, but it's definitely an important paper that has uh, had an influence on, on this, uh, on the Alzheimer's research field. Uh, an even more recent case was the Stanford president, uh, the big boss of Stanford University, where I have worked also for 15 years. Uh, this guy became president um, a month before I left there, so I, I don't really know anything about him, but he uh, had worked at Genentech and there are several papers that he has published that appear to contain duplicated images. And uh, yeah, he's now under investigation and nothing has been proven, but it's, it doesn't look very good. There are some Genentech employees who have uh, uh, testified, well, not in court, but they have uh, re talked to a reporter um, that he had done uh, he was investigated for science misconduct, which he denies. So the jury is still out, but he's the big, the big boss of uh, one of the most important research universities in the world. So I feel he should step down at least temporarily while this investigation is, um, is ongoing. And the university appeared to have tried to keep this really indoors, but the Stanford Daily, which is a student run newspaper reported about this and Theo Baker, the, the, 
for, like a, he's a first year student. He's like a freshman at Stanford. He's 18 years old. He won the Polk Awards a couple of days ago, one of the Polk Awards for, um, for writing about this. And uh, I think he's the youngest person to have ever received one of those awards. Uh, and then, of course, COVID-19 has, has also had a lot of uh, ups and downs, uh, some fraudulent papers. You might have heard about the, the Sergi Sphere paper that claimed that hydroxychloroquine did not work. That turned out to be completely fabricated, or at least that suspected these papers in the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine were retracted. Um, there has been DJ Raoul who claimed that hydroxychloroquine did work. His work is now under investigation, uh, criminal investigation even, because it appears he has changed some of the values, fabricated uh, and even perhaps fabricated some results, but definitely it appears that it was falsified. And then there have been papers about ivermectin, whether it works or not, um, and some of which, some of those papers also were retracted for suspicions of misconduct. And so if you do a meta-analysis where you compare lots of different studies um, and you leave those fraudulent or potential fraudulent papers in, it looks like I ivermectin works to prevent or treat COVID-19. But if you take out those potential fraud fraudulent studies, suddenly the results look very different and ivermectin appears to not work. And so there's these ongoing discussions and it really looks like it's not working, but it's it's still under investigation. And it's just a lot of fraud and it's, it's just horrible because it, it makes it so much harder to to really know which medications will work against COVID-19. Of course, we all want small, easy molecule, a cheap molecule to work, but if it's based on fraudulent studies, you cannot really rely on that. And it's very hard to find out if these cases were, were fraudulent or not. A lot of detectives are working on that. Now I specialize in images. So I will look at images in a scientific paper. And um, of course, when you think about images in a scientific paper, they might look like some of these. On the left, you see a bunch of what I call line graphs. These are sort of vector-based images, heat maps, bar graphs, plots. Uh, and it's very hard to know if those images are real or not. Uh, I happen to have made two of them, so I know they're based on real data. But line graphs are really hard to, to detect fraud in. But photos, you might occasionally see fraudulent data or just a plain error. So if you look at the images on the right, they're all photos. They're photos of tissue, photos of mice or gels or proteins. Um, and, and you could look at them and you can see, for example, if you focus on this image, even if you don't know what they are, it's like stained, uh, differently stained photos of tissues. They're all different. And so, um, of course, I, I look at these by eye and it will take me a while to stare at these things to see that there's no overlap and I might miss an overlap. But if I find an overlap, and the labels suggest that these are representing different experiments, that could mean that it's an error or it could mean that there's fraud. So I look at images like the ones you can see on the right, and I try to see if I can see signs of errors or misconduct in them. Now, of course, we're all very used to Photoshopping. I feel Photoshopping almost is, is part of our normal lives nowadays. A lot of models on magazines might be photoshopped. If you look at the image on the left, uh, that was the real photo. And then the image on the right, as it ended up on a, the cover of a magazine. And this is Faith Hill. She's a country singer in the US. And you can, you can stare at these two images and you'll see that her arms and her legs are suddenly much thinner. Like uh, look at, you know, some of her natural body fat and you know that that's just the, the the way she naturally looks and she's very beautiful without photoshopping but this is all like photoshopped away um uh, there's suddenly an arm here that is not there it, it's just it's just very weird and and i think we're all so used to photoshopping as a way to make our our images and our uh, our lives look better than they really are that it's very hard to to know what is real anymore and also we use photos as, as proof that something happened. But if we can Photoshop images, that also means we can, we can uh, yeah, play with the truth. So all the images on this particular photo have been Photoshopped in some way. They don't represent what really happened. Like maybe a president is so dumb that he's holding a children's book upside down or the audience of a particular uh, rally uh, with the president uh, appear to have been contain photoshopped elements 
or you want to have a stock photo that rep better represents that your workers are diverse by photoshopping in a blind man and a woman in a wheelchair. These have been photoshopped in, but it's it's hard to recognize if these are uh, if it's well done. It's hard to recognize that photos have been photoshopped. But what we can recognize with our eyes and also with computer software is duplications. So here's a missile launch. One of the ro rockets or missiles didn't go off, so they photoshopped. The, the I think this one didn't go off, and so they just photoshopped uh, this rocket in here, and they photoshopped some of the the, the smoke here. Um, and so we recognize that these things have been photoshopped. Hoovercrafts can be photoshopped to make it look more impressive. And here you can see that the audience have been photoshopped. So it's hard to recognize a good Photoshop, but it's a little bit easier to recognize duplication. And so that is what I'm focusing on in scientific papers. Here are some examples of scientific images that have been manipulated. Um, this is the original image, and you can just Photoshop maybe a band away that you don't want to show. This band was here, but now it's gone. Um, or the same image as here. Uh, you can actually um, duplicate some areas. And so the duplication is what we recognize. And there's also duplication here, sort of background cloning, stamping. And those are the things we can recognize as, as altered images. So if you look at scientific papers, there's three types of duplications that you might detect. So here on the left are what I call simple duplications. You just have a bunch of photos. Some of the photos as shown here with red boxes or blue boxes are identical. And they were represented as different experiments, but maybe by accident, somebody grabbed the wrong photo. So I do wanna point out this, this is not necessarily science misconduct. It could just be an error. Somebody just made a bunch of photos, didn't label them well, it's sloppy, but it's not necessarily science misconduct. So these are simple duplications. Here in the middle, I have an example of a repositioned duplications. So there are four panels here, different amounts of radiation with which cells were treated. And these two, two, these top two panels are treated with either no radiation or two gray, uh, that's a measure for the amount of radiation. These two panels appear to overlap and the two gray and eight gray panels also appear to overlap. So at least these three panels are all taken from the same, uh, the same specimen. It was just moved under the microscope a little bit and a new photo was taken, but there is an overlap visible suggesting that these were not different experiments, but the same cells, the same little Petri dish that was photographed. And here on the right is an example of a, what I call type three duplication, an alteration within the photo. So this is more like the examples I showed on the previous slides with the Hoover craft and the missiles being duplicated within the same photo. You see in photo A, you see that panel lane ones and three appear to look identical. While in panel D, three lanes appear to look identical shown here with the red boxes. And there's also some, some signs of copy pasting here. Um, and so that's a, this, these types of duplications within a photo appear to all, always have been done deliberately. So distinguishing between these three different types of duplications will give an idea whether or not something was done deliberately with the intention to mislead. And again, I'll wanna point out that a simple duplication could just be an error, most likely. The type three duplication, the alterated images are most likely to have been done deliberately. Well, the type two duplications where there's a repositioning, it could be either way. You could just by accident again, mislabel an image. If you make hundreds of photos and you just don't label them very well, um, it's sloppy. But there are also papers where there's lots of these duplications and especially when there's overlaps with uh, not just a shift, but a mirroring or rotation that suggests an intention to mislead. I do want to point out that I don't always, uh, it's hard to tell just by looking at a photo if it was done intentionally or not. And of course there's multiple authors on a paper and so you don't really want to point fingers towards somebody, but it, there always needs to be an investigation done at the institution. You cannot just know what happened, what really happened and who was really responsible for these duplications without, uh, by just looking at the paper and without doing an investigation 
at the institution, you really have to go back to the lab, no books and, and know what has happened there. So uh, I just have one example here. If you, can, if you can spot the duplication yourself. So here are seven photos of, uh, they're all of cells being treated with different compounds. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you understand this, but uh, you can see that the, all the seven labels have different, different um, yeah, they have, all have different labels, so they're all different treatments. And uh, but there's two panels here that are identical, and uh, maybe you have spotted them already. Some people can see this, and some people cannot. Uh, that's just you know, that's how you were born. Uh, you can train yourself by uh, getting better, but uh, I can spot these things by eye, and I think most people can. But uh, yeah, I hope you have spotted it by now. These two panels, uh, NS and E2 appear to be identical. So this is a type one duplication. And again, I want to point out, this could be an honest error. I don't think there's any reason to suspect an intention to mislead. Um, but I wrote to the journal in, 2000 and, uh, in 2015, in October, and this, this paper never got corrected. I don't think this should be uh, addressed with a retraction, but it hasn't been corrected. And of course, this is not the end of the world. If this is the only error in a paper, we can live with it. It was probably very similar, but yeah, it's it's an error that was made. Now, sometimes these duplications can can be quite intense. So here are three. Uh, 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 well, I don't even know how many. Lots of duplications here in Figure Three uh, of a particular paper, and I think this goes beyond what you could blame on an honest error. I feel with so many duplicated images that either suggest an intention to mislead or an extreme sloppiness where just random photos were representing different experiments. I would not trust any other results if researchers make that many errors. And so this paper got retracted. It was published in PLOS One. Uh, took a couple of years before it got retracted because I reported it in October 2015. And uh, yeah, I think that's a good outcome. Now here's an example of a type three duplication. So here are duplicated elements within the same photo. You see three different photos and you might already spot that there appear to be some lines here. And if you look carefully, you might spot that, that these four lanes are all identical. So uh, maybe, maybe this photo, if I go back, this photo never uh, took place. Maybe they just took this this lane and they duplicated it a couple of times here, they even rotated it. So this is a type three duplication. Within the same photo, we see duplicated elements. This is very likely to have been done with the intention to mislead. And this paper got retracted and I think that's a good outcome. But look at how long it took for the journal to reach that conclusion. I mean, I would see this in five seconds. This is what I call a five second retraction, but it took multiple years before it got retracted. And of course, you want the journal to write to the, to the authors, and then the authors can provide their original photos. But I feel there's just nothing that could justify this. But yeah, it took many years. So action by journals is just very, very slow and sometimes non-existent. Another example, um, here are duplicated spores, like parts of these photos appear to be duplicated. And the journal addresses with a correction. And, and I'm just, this makes me mad because you know, people are cheating here and just getting a tiny slap on the finger and the paper got corrected. I feel this should have been a retraction, but the journal disagreed with me. Another example of a, what I think is a heavily photoshopped image. Um, this is a southern blot by a professor from Marseille that I feel has a lot of papers with, with problems. Uh, this photo appears to have duplicated elements marked here by me with the colored boxes. And this paper hasn't been uh, addressed yet. I did report it a couple of months ago, but uh, I don't think I even got a, a comment back from the journal that it would look into this. And these duplications can also happen in plots. Here's an example of a plot where parts of the plot appear to have been duplicated. This paper got retracted. And this actually was relatively fast within a year. I'll take this that as a win. So I did um, a lot of research like this. I scanned just to find out how often do we see these inappropriate image duplication. And again, I want to 
point out that by inappropriate image duplication, I just mean images that have been duplicated, either category one, two, or three, not really suggesting that all of these are fraud, but they're inappropriate image duplication. They're, they're either errors or fraud, but they should not have happened. So I wanted to know what the prevalence was. How often do you find these types of duplications? And it's just a general sign. I'm just looking at images, but it's sort of a general measure for how often errors that are visible from just looking at the paper, how often can we find these? So I scanned a bunch of papers, 20,000, uh, a lot of papers, but I just look at, at the images. I didn't read these papers. So it's, it's a little bit faster than you might think. And I did this while I was still employed at Stanford. So I still had a full-time job. So this was my, my hobby. I scanned these 20,000 papers spanning 20 different years by eye. And I was looking for duplications within a paper, not between papers, that's really hard, but within a paper. I made sure to include different journals, different publishers. And in that set of uh, 20,000 papers, I found 800 papers, 4%, to contain duplications like the ones I've just shown you. I also have to say, I only focused on papers in molecular biology that had photos. If they didn't have a photo, I didn't count it in the 20,000. So I enriched for papers that had uh, specific terms in them to make sure that they had at least one photo. Um, does that mean that 4% of all papers contain these? Uh, is, 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 are all of these fraudulent? Um, well, we made a, a guess, sort of a, a wild guess, that about half of them were, uh, were done with the intention to mislead based on the three categories that we found and the distribution over those three categories. Now, does that mean that 2% of all papers contains fraud? Because that would be a big extrapolation. I only looked at molecular biology papers that had photos. Um, so you could argue well, a lot of other papers do not have photos. A lot of, if you look at a lot of physics papers or uh, math papers or chemistry papers, they don't really have photos. Um, even papers in my own field, microbiology, have surprisingly few photos. It's all line graphs and, and, and tables and stuff like that. Now, I think the real percentage of fraud might be even higher than 2% because photos are visible. They leave traces of fraud. If you really run a fraud, there's many ways you can fraud without leaving traces. I mean, I, you can just pipette a little bit less of a particular protein into your gel and it looks like there's less of that. Um, or you can uh, just move the microscope a little further so there's no overlap for me to find. Or you can just make up some numbers in a beautiful table. And that would also not be detectable. So I think the real percentage of fraud it's mu is much higher than 2%. It might be in the 5 to 10% range. Now, uh, how do journals respond? I showed you the Economist uh, headline uh, in, in one of my first slides. And journals are just very slow to respond to allegations of misconduct or just plain errors in papers. And I think that's very bad. Um, of that set of almost 800 papers that I reported, that I investigated and I published in that uh, initial set of 20,000 papers that I screened, the 800 papers with problems are reported to the journals around 2014 and 15. So waiting for five years and sending a reminder has not really resulted in a lot of action. In fact, after five years, so around 2020, Two thirds of these papers had not been acted upon. There was just no action, no correction or retraction. And one third of the papers had been corrected or retracted, or there's a tiny sliver of expression of concern, which is sort of a, you know, we're not quite sure yet, but we think it's of concern, but we haven't retracted the paper. It's sort of a in-between status. So two thirds of these papers are just not addressed after waiting five years, that's just a terribly wrong time. In the meantime, a lot of papers could have been cited. A lot of research could have been built on those papers. And it's just maddening. It's even more maddening than knowing that there's fraud in science, that journals and publishers are just looking the other way and seem to be very slow in taking actions. And in the Economist uh, article, some scientists even say, well, we don't even report it to the journals anymore because they're just not going to res respond anyways. And so why would we even bother sending an email to them? And that's just bad because we all 
tend to think that science is self-correcting. If we find an error, it gets quickly corrected. But then the journals have to have to work on that, but they're they're not doing it for a variety of reasons. Uh, you know, it's just too much work. They just are interested in the money um, of, of scientific publishing, or you know, they are maybe threatened by the author to be sued. There could be all kinds of reasons. Maybe the authors are not responding very valid because people move around and email addresses change. And so people might disappear and not be able to be reached or people just point fingers. The one author blames the other author, the other author denies it. And it becomes this, this very complex uh, legal case. But I feel um, that there's, there's two different things. Like one can be a real problem with the paper. And the other question is who has done it? And those should be separate things. And uh, Holden Thorpe, who is the editor in chief of Science, one of the top journals uh, in the world in, in scientific publishing, uh, he has written a nice editorial saying that we should, as scientific publishers, actually just look at the paper. Don't worry about institutional investigation about like who did it, or what really happened. If we really think that there's a big problem with a paper, we should just retract and leave the question of who is responsible for the actual photoshopping or the actual fabrication of the data, leave that question to the institution to sort it. But those should be two separate things. And I completely agree with that. So knowing that it's very hard for a scientific paper to be either corrected or retracted, I now just post all my concerns on a website called pubpeer.com. So pubpeer is a website where you can leave on a paper. They also have a plugin which works well with, with lots of different browsers. And so if you install the plugin that they have, um, so I have Chrome, for example, as my browser. And if I do a literature search, this, this is a, a screenshot of PubMed, which uh, not to be confused with PubPeer, but PubMed is a uh, website where you can search for scientific papers. You search for an author name or you search for a paper name. And then if that particular paper has a concern posted on PubMed, here, you will see these green banners. And so, if, but you have to have the pub here plugin installed. Uh, so I have that and I see these, these banners and I can click on them and I can, for example, this is a pub here comment where I posted concerns about an image uh, from a scientific paper that appeared to have lots of duplicated little elements. And you can click on that and, you know, decide for yourself if you agree with that uh, paper, uh, if you suspect fraud or not. Uh, and it's not just image concerns that are posted on Papier. It can be all kinds of uh, concerns about uh, methodology of a paper, about conflicts of interest, about animal ethics, human uh, research ethics, all kinds of things can be posted there. So I would recommend if you, if you are looking for a specific paper and you have doubts, uh, or maybe an author, you can use this plugin to as a rough estimate of knowing if an author or a particular paper has received critical comments. Uh, I also have to say that some of my papers, because I am, of course, my type of work annoys a lot of other people, and uh, especially people who I might have found, you know, in their papers, I might have found some problems. A lot of these authors will respond back by trying to search for errors in my papers, uh, which I completely understand. And as a revenge, a lot of my papers have received comments, uh, which are not always, I find, very, you know, valid, but I'll leave that up to you. So it's, there's also a lot of revenge posting there, I feel, but most of it is, um, is well thought, and I uh, agree with most of the comments. It is a moderated site. You cannot just say, uh, I think the research is fraudulent. You have to word it carefully. You have to show evidence. So we, we show these images. We, we might say concern about figure 2A. Here's the image and it appears to have duplicated elements and we draw our colored boxes around it. Or we think the tumors in this particular paper, these, these mice are too big. Uh, there are animal ethics guidelines. We feel those have been violated. Here's the graph, here's the link to the guidelines and it feels to be in conflict with each other. So you cannot just say this is a fraud. You have to present some objective evidence. Now, uh, a question I get a lot, well, is that you detect these things by eye, why don't you use software? And I have started to use that. Two years ago, 
uh, there were several tools that came out and I worked with um, a DARPA challenge, media forensics, where a lot of research groups were trying to find a, to a software to detect these duplications. And some of those use artificial intelligence, AI, and some of them use other techniques. I'm, you know, I just use my eyes. I'm not quite sure how I see these things, but uh, of course, part of this work could be done much better and much faster by a computer. And so about two years ago, I switched. I'm not using Image Twin um, as my first screen. And Image Twin is pretty good in finding lots of duplications very fast. You just dump the PDF in there. And I have, uh, it, it, it's not free software, uh, but it, it can do a lot of uh, things. There are some other software tools that are free, um, like Sherlock is one, but you have to really know uh, Linux to install it. So I couldn't really do it by myself. Uh, Proofic is another one that uh, several um, publishers are now starting to use to screen the incoming manuscripts with. But you cannot 100% rely on these things because sometimes I see with my eyes a clear duplication and, and Proofic and Image Twin will both miss it or they will find things that are false positive. So yeah, they find the duplication, but it's it's an okay duplication. It's not a problem. And so you have to still have a human with some experience to to run these softwares they're uh, they're going to have false positives and false negatives so i feel they're not always as good as a human um but in some cases they have completely surprised me image twin has a database of of uh, images from open access papers and sometimes it will find that an image has been reused in another paper and those findings are almost impossible to find by the human eye but of course, AI, artificial intelligence can also um, create a lot of duplications or a lot of falsified images. So I'm very worried about this. And I think this, this worry is shared with, with a lot of uh, journalists as well, because we rely so much on our eyes. Seeing is believing. If we see an image, we tend to believe it. The images here, these two people here, these two faces do not, this, these persons do not exist. These faces are generated by the random face generator. Uh, it's called thispersondoesntexist.com. And it will just generate a random face every time you hit refresh. And this is, this is unbelievable because these faces look to me, I'm very bad actually in facial recognition, but to me, these faces look very believable. There are some things that you can recognize if you are trained that they're not real, but this could easily pass for, for a real person. And, that if, if you know how much of our brain, uh, not in my brain, but in most other people's brain, they're good in facial recognitions. I mean, these are um, the nose is in the right place and the eyes are like if that was a little bit uh, set off, we would recognize it as as a wrong image as, as, you know, the nose is in the wrong place or so. But these images look very believable. And if we if we know that we could recognize it as as wrong, if we know how much of our brain capacity is going towards facial recognition, you can uh, hopefully appreciate how easy it would be to make a, a photo of, of cells. Like cells don't really have noses and ears. They already look very quickly like a cell. So people are playing with Del E, which is one of those uh, random or one of those image generators. If you give it enough prompts, it will produce photos that look sort of real. And this was already, uh, you know, half a year old. So I think by now the technology is improving so quickly that it will be very likely that we can that that people with bad intentions can make photos that look like real science experiments and those are very hard to recognize because there's no duplications there's no overlap with an existing image it's a unique image but it's completely fake and how uh, both as scientists and journalists how can we distinguish fake from real anymore if if we as humans rely so much on our eyes to believe that something has happened, it it's probably, I, 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 I don't know how journalists deal with this, but as a news agency, I, I guess you would be very worried if a person comes to you with an image, with a photo of like a war situation or a demonstration somewhere. How, how do you know that that photo is real? We cannot longer rely on our eyes to know that a photo is real anymore. And, and this is, is going to be a very big problem um, in both science and as well as, uh, as uh, journalism. And here are some papers already showing that you can make 
images that look surprisingly real. And this is, uh, I think, also from last year. I think this technology is, is rapidly improving. And I also think this that this could be used or maybe is already being used to generate completely fake papers. There's this, this problem that we call paper mills. So paper mills are, um, yeah, I'm not sure how to describe them. I guess they're companies that write fake papers. They look pretty realistic. They have photos, they have graphs. We believe they're completely fake. And they sell these papers to authors who need an authorship. And this is a big problem in certain countries. There are countries that have very strict requirements about how many papers you should publish to either get your master's degrees or your PhD or become a doctor. So for example, in China, there's a rule that if you are going to medical school and you're done with your medical school and you want to become a doctor in a, uh, in a hospital, you have to publish one or two research papers. But these are medical doctors. They're not necessarily interested in research. And so they don't have time to do research. They don't work in a research facility. They treat patients. That's what they do. And so how do they, how do they uh, check this box? How do they publish their paper? They will just buy a paper. They will see advertisements, perhaps on social media, to buy an authorship. And they will invest some money to, to cross that barrier, to, to, you know, to get their paper. And it's not because people in certain countries are more fraudulent than others, but it's because of national regulations that are very different in, in certain countries to get papers, to write papers and, and get authorships. So these, um, these uh, paper mills are very active in countries like China, uh, Iran, Russia. And there's many people like me, like image detectives and, and other detectives, I guess, um, who work on these uh, paper mills and who have found many of them and just listing some of their names here and giving credit um, because I'm, you know, I, I often get credit for work that some of these people have done. So I want to make sure that I mention their names. There's lots of people working on this problem, trying to find them, trying to identify these fake papers. And we can often recognize them because they have the, the companies that make them sometimes make errors and they reuse images. And sometimes that's how we can find them. And uh, but we believe there are tens of thousands of fabricated papers, for example, coming from China. And um, it's just an incredible amount of papers that we, we, we believe has infiltrated certain areas of science and that we can no longer believe. Uh, as an example, and I think this might have been produced with some computer program, I'm not quite sure, but if you look at these images, they, they, the left image and the right image come from two different papers. Um, the background of these images are, is identical. And while the bands are look sort of, the bands look unique, but we believe these are computer generated images that are put, the error they made that the paper mill made here is that they happen to use the same background. And so we found uh, hundreds of papers that all were using these backgrounds and we could find them by certain, they had certain, um, title structures that were recognizable and, and because they were all written on a template. And so we could find uh, hundreds of these papers and yeah, they all have like a little stripe here that you might recognize and other stripes and the backgrounds of these images is all the same. And th this is how we could recognize them. And they might've been chided similar to technology as this, this person doesn't exist. They'll come. I'm not quite sure how they generated, but uh, they made this error of the same background. And that's how we could nail them. But you know, now of course we have taught the fraudsters how to better fraud and use different uh, backgrounds. Um, and then finally, there's uh, you know the problem of the type of work that people like me do is we criticize scientific papers. And of course, I understand that that the researchers whose work we are criticizing are not happy with that. I completely get that. But I've faced some legal challenges. I have not been sued yet. But I have definitely had some, some threats of being sued, uh, particularly um, a French microbiologist, DJ Raoul, who has repeatedly made uh, threats that he's going to sue me and that he filed a police complaint against me. Uh, so I haven't heard anything officially, but um, yeah, it made me a little bit scared. Nothing has happened so far, and I've had a lot of support from the scientific community that if I see 
if I want to criticize a person, I should not be sued for that. I mean, if my complaints are real, uh, I should, you know, have some legal protection. But because I'm acting alone, I don't have a university backing me. It is very risky, the type of work I do. But I'm willing to risk everything to be able to criticize scientific papers. And I try to be polite and objective as best as I can. But this particular scientist named me all kinds of horrible things online and he has millions of views on his uh, YouTube videos. And so it's, it's very complex. There's no legal protection for the work that we do, even though I feel that the scientific community should be able to support me. And of course they did by signing an open letter, uh, got lots of, you know, thousands of people signed those letters, but there's no financial support for the work in, uh, and no real legal protection. So this is a, I feel a gap in the, in the scientific world that we need to address. So with that, I want to end uh, with this last slide. I have some, some discussion points. Again, I wanna uh, restate that for me, science is about discovering the truth. And if we find errors or uh, suspicions of misconduct as scientists, we should be able to raise concerns even after a paper has been published and peer reviewed. The image duplication that I detect is the tip of the iceberg. There's many more ways that you could find problems in scientific papers. You can look at tables, you can look at uh, graphs, uh, methodology, animal ethics, uh, human subject, uh, ethical concerns. It's just the tip of the iceberg. We can, if there is fraud, it's hard to detect, uh, even by scientists who are very uh, knowledgeable in a certain field. There's probably a lot of fraud that goes undetected. And of course, it's all driven by the pressure we feel as scientists to publish. And it's it's much better to publish nice and shiny positive results than negative results. Elizabeth, I might uh, uh, stop you there for a second because oh. uh, we we have an hour or so. I just, uh, I'm anxious so that people can get the opportunity to ask you questions. Would that be okay? Yeah, I can I can stop here, sure. Um, be Sorry now to, to stop you there, but uh, yeah, I'm just I'm going to ask people to put any kind of questions that they have now. They can put them in the quest in the Q&A and uh, I'll see them there and I'll put them to Elizabeth. Um, so it's it's quite shocking this. I, I might kick kick it off here. Uh, you know, you mentioned five to 10 percent of papers. Are, are you talking also about the because I know as a journalist, I would look at the important papers, the New England Journal and Science and Nature. Mm -hmm. Are you also talking about those papers? The, the Yes, one. definitely. The, so the paper I was talking about, the Alzheimer's research, was published in, in Nature. And uh, there's some other papers. The, the papers from the Stanford president also involve, uh, one of them involves a Genentech paper that he published during his tenure there that was also a Nature paper. Uh, I found also image duplication in science papers. Although I have to say that the higher the impact factor, the lower the chances that you find these duplications. But there might be, you know, those might just be better fraudsters. They might be more experienced and they know how to not leave traces. Yeah. And in terms of what we can do about it, because there are a number of pretty big problems there that you outlined. Um, you know, the AI is getting better. The AI can be used on both sides of the equation. So are we going to get into a kind of an arms race, do you think, between those who are trying to commit fraud and those who are trying to catch them? Or how, how, what's the way forward here? Uh, excellent question. I'm I'm not sure because I, I do feel by talking about fraud, I, I tell the fraudsters how to not make the mistakes. And yes, it is an arms race. It's like, you know, you put a bigger lock on your door and you hope that the, uh, that the, 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 your neighbor gets robbed instead of you. I don't know. Like, like it's, you just make as, as publishers and, and uh, journals, you can put higher barriers, for example, sharing original data. But you can also imagine that if you are a smart fraudster, you can generate original data that looks very real, uh, you know, random enough to not generate any suspicions. Um, so it is an arms race. And I think by sharing original results, you can put a higher barrier on, on doing fraud, but it's not going to completely uh, prevent it at all. Okay. Uh, I'm just waiting to see if anybody now would like to put up their hand or ask a question here. Um, okay. 
while I'm waiting for that. Uh, you mentioned some of the personal stuff that can happen. Uh, that's that can get pretty nasty, I'd say. Uh, you know, do, does it? Do you sometimes question whether it's worth being a whistleblower? Um, occasionally, <laughs> I will ask that question. I've uh, always come to the conclusion: yes, like somebody needs to do it, and maybe because I'm independent, I could do this work better than you know if I was a a younger earlier in my career um, and I was employed at a university. This type of work would perhaps even be harder because you know I might have a boss, a professor who tells me, "Calm down, don't rock the boat." I I feel by by not being uh, not having a boss, and I can actually I can do more because I also don't have to worry about my career, uh, about being fired, about having a person write a negative letter of recommendation. So I can I can do this work because I'm independent, and I've always found it work like worth risking perhaps you know my personal financial situation i hope i'll get support if i ever am sued i get support from the scientific community which is of course you know i'm not sure if i'll get that but i'll i do feel it's a fight worth fighting and i try to you know i use the word fighting i i try to be polite i try to just raise concerns and not you know sling any insults to other people and i think that's the best i can do Okay, we have a question here from Samantha Carrillo. So she says, nice talk. I'm wondering, have you found a correlation between subject and misconduct? Uh, are there subjects more prone to have more duplicated images or false data? Um, I haven't really done a research, so I focused on molecular biology papers. So those were oncology, microbiology, uh, that's sort of the field I'm comfortable with. But those topics have a lot of images like i said before there's there's papers like uh papers in physics or chemistry that just don't have a lot of photos so there might be fraud in there but it might be very hard to detect and somebody else has mentioned probably the only field that has where it's really hard to do fraud is mathematics because you cannot really uh you know fake a formula and people who are reviewing these things are very careful about detecting errors and so maybe there's less fraud in math but uh i think you know the biomedical literature has exploded over the past year so it's also a matter of the denominator how many papers are published in a field personally i found that papers with nano uh, nanotechnology so nanoparticles nano whatever um if they have photos they have a high they appear to have a higher chance of having photoshopping but uh I, that's just because i look at photos Okay, so it's a, you know we've quite a few science journalists who are listening to you here, and it's it's great to have you. Um, and one of the questions we have from one of our science journalists, Maria, um, what what do you think science journalists can do, or what would you expect them to be able to do, or what they're not doing, what they could do more of, maybe? Um, I I don't think like detecting these types of things is very specialistic work. And I don't expect people to, who have no experience in that to really be able to detect it. But what, how uh, journalists can work, can help the work we do is to write about fraud and to make people aware of it and to, to write about how institutions and publishers appear to not respond to these cases. But some of these cases appear to be, there's, a, there's usually a very big problem with a paper and then either the journal or the institution tries to put it under the rug and say, well, we don't really care. So the reason I mentioned the Stanford Daily Research is I'm very, like these papers have been flagged for, with problems by the Stanford president, have been flagged. Nobody seemed to really care about it. Stanford was definitely not interested in investigating them. Then a science, um, the Stanford Daily, so a student newspaper wrote about it, forcing the university to respond. Then they wanted to do an internal investigation. The journalist wrote about like, that's not good. It should be an external uh, investigation because these people have worked with the president. That's conflict of interest. And so then Stanford responded and didn't, and now is going to set up an external investigation. It's only because of journalism that institutions and publishers are, they have to respond and they have to investigate these cases in a more objective and honest ways because I think if we if journalists don't write about it, they try to hide it. They try to, you know, put it somewhere safe and internal that nobody cares about it. 
It's okay. only because of journalism. We yeah, can we, yeah, we've got hear about it. Like you. <laughs> okay, Jessica <laughs> says, um, thank you so much for your work. I work in publishing and this is something we're very concerned about. What things can we do on our side to help? In publishing, uh, I think just being aware that there's a potential for fraud. And of course, you know, I, I do think that 95% of the papers are fine, uh, not fraudulent, but having a particular person as a publisher hired who can look at papers with, you know, putting the glasses on or the hat on of like, this could be fraud and looking at it that way. Also hiring dedicated people who can screen papers for uh, statistical errors. That's a, you know, as I feel as a reviewer, I don't have the capacity to look at statistical problems. So I feel that publishers should hire specialists who can screen manuscripts for all kinds of errors. And there's a list of things you can, you can screen for. You're never going to be able to detect all fraud, but asking for original data, asking critical questions is already, um, you know, going to work as a deterrent for fraud. Uh, I'll put in one of my own just while I'm waiting for maybe the final one or two questions. Um, can be, the publishing system, there seems to be an issue there. Uh, is there any better way that we can do it? Like, for example, could we, this is in an ideal world, put a paper up. If there's a problem, then it's like a live document that can be uh, changed uh, rather than just pulling it out completely. Like in most, okay, do that if it's if it's particularly uh, bad and very deliberate. But in cases where there are errors, so we can just kind of whittle it down to the ones that are uh, deliberate. Yeah, I mean that. I think that's a um, has been proposed maybe more in the sense of micro publications where you just publish one figure, you know. So sort of toss away the whole traditional scientific publishing. Uh, world which has become more and more complex but publishing smaller chunks of data let's say one figure and then having other people comment on that so elife uh, is one of the journals that is playing with that new model uh, they they sort of have a live peer review and the paper will uh, sort of be peer reviewed completely in the open and people can leave comments uh, so they're playing with with ideas like that definitely um, but yeah, the scientific publishing world is uh, very slow to respond and very conservative. So it's going to take a while, but there are initiatives supporting yeah. that type of um, publishing models. Okay. We have a, uh, one more, we might take one more question there. Um, Christina Candel, she says, uh, thanks for this great talk. Do you know if scientific journals systematically use any kind of image duplication software? Yeah, so um, the one I, I mentioned earlier, uh, Proofic, is uh, being tested by several of the publishers. I'm not quite sure which ones, but I think a couple of the bigger ones, like uh, I'm, I'm assuming Elsevier and uh, Wiley and, and publishers like that. So they're testing Proofic. Um, unfortunately, I feel they're just testing the software and sort of as a way of like, well, Proofic didn't find any duplication, so there's no problem because I've had that response by editors and I'm mad about it like come on i've i've screened by now a hundred thousand papers i'm like a human expert yes i'm human but doesn't necessarily mean the story is always right uh you cannot just blindly rely on that you still have to have an expert interpreting the results so uh sage jessica says sage publishing publishing is used using profi oh, proof 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 yeah yeah that's that's okay. the one i mentioned yeah yes. okay okay so and, and finally, then, I guess, uh, just to bring it to a conclusion, I mean, it, how optimistic or, or, or not are you about how things are going to pan out here? Are you going to win this fight? <laughs> Never. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think I, I do think we need some national, uh, some governments uh, fighting for, you know, things like paper mills. They're just, you know, not being taken down by national uh, institutions. Uh, so that's that's one big problem, and I cannot fight, for example, the Chinese government if they think it's not a problem. You know what can I do? Uh, but yeah, we can make people more aware of these problems. But I'm a bit pessimistic about AI and how this is. You know, not just writing text. I don't see necessarily a problem with writing. You know, helping a robot write your your text, but um, having a robot generate your fake images. I do have a problem with that, and I'm very worried about being able to detect that. But maybe there will be a, uh, a solution for that, but I'm not quite sure. 
Okay, we have, um, well, this one person doesn't leave their name, but anyway, many thanks for your talk. Is uh, Can we expect a more reliable publishing system by using highly adapted AI software to compare or control before peer reviews? Yeah, so this is the, you know, the bot against bot race, I guess, where people try to generate fake data by using AI and then having AI tools to detect if it's fake or not. I'm not quite sure which of the robots is going to win this fight. Um, uh, I think it's too early to tell, uh, but I think in the end, maybe we can only know if a paper is real by being able to reproduce it. And I hope we go towards a model where science is sort of slowing down. We have way too many science papers uh, coming out every day, but being having part of science just trying to replicate results and only then if it's replicable, we know that the, it was real. I think we have to move to that model. Rather than the pressure of publishing. And it, it, exactly, is there yeah. for, for people like, well, myself and probably a few others, can we do anything to help in terms of, uh, do you take donations? You're talking about financial help or, you know, <laughs> people, if they want to help you in your work, how might they do that? Well, I, I, I hope that, uh, like the people who are journalists who are listening will will write about these cases. I feel there's um, there's that that is tremendously helpful. Having you know objective reporting about these cases of investigation and how they're being swept under the rug by uh, publishers and institutions that's extremely helpful. Um, if you want to donate, uh, you know, money, uh, I have a Patreon account. I can put the oh, I can put it in the chat. That would yeah. be very nice. Let's see. I have to say it. Will only the host and panelists see it if I post yeah. it here? Okay. I think we can give it to people afterwards, maybe. But yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I can. I mean, I would. I think it's well. It's Patreon.com. Uh, oh, enter, and then you have to search for my name, Elizabeth Bick. Patreon. I think it's Patreon. Patreon.com/slash Elizabeth Bick. I think is the the link. We'll find you. Uh, okay. Thank you. I much appreciate. I mean, only like like you know, one pound a day or whatever, a one pound a month, uh, or sure, that's that's already welcome. No problem at all. So listen, thank you very okay. very much. That that was a great talk, and I think lots of people would have got a lot from it. I know I did, and uh, we wish you well in your luck or in your work, I should say. But you need luck. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. If you're ever coming uh, this direction, this part of the world, we'd be delighted to meet up with you and host you and uh, talk great. to you. So I'll, I'll take you on on that. <laughs> All right. Well, it was great hearing, uh, being here. Thank you for inviting me and have a lovely evening. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.